We're living in biblical times, epic times, things that it's almost like we're reading pages of the Bible take place before our very eyes. And the question always to ask is, well, what does the Bible say about these things that are happening before our very eyes? And I'm going to start with Genesis 12.3. It's a review for some of you. God said, I'll bless those who bless you, Israel, and I'm going to curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now, no one should ever take lightly that promise from God. You shouldn't take it lightly because it's true. If you look at history, for me, that's a great verse for atheists. You could take that one verse and go, okay, if you don't believe in God, how do you explain this one? I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you because throughout history, those who have blessed Israel have been blessed against all odds, and those who have cursed Israel have, have come to uh, ruin in many cases, and I'll explain that. God made that promise to Abraham at the dawn of civilization, the dawn of history 4,000 years ago. And from that very moment, church, the enemy's aim has been to destroy Israel. It doesn't make sense in the natural. Israel's a tiny country, and, and there's been more persecution and punishment against Israel, and, and it's failed but the nation of Israel has always been persecuted because Satan hates the prophetic agenda of God. Make no mistake. And last week, it's been a dark week on the world stage. Israel is at war. Yesterday, today, or tomorrow, I don't know which day, but I think it's the 7th. What's today? It's 5th. Okay, so the one-year anniversary of the, the attack last year um, is upon us. And that attack was when thousands of Iranian-backed Iranian, Iranian -backed Hamas terrorists from Gaza burst into Israel in pickup trucks and on motorcycles, and they committed unimaginable atrocities against the Jewish people. They savagely murdered 1,200 people. They raped and mutilated women. They beheaded men. They burned babies alive. They burned entire families alive, babies, children, and parents, grandparents, in scenes that are reminiscent of Nazi Germany, the Holocaust. It was a horrible demonic assault which began a war that Israel has been fighting every day since. A war also that they've been winning. So I want to talk about it because the Bible is relevant and the Bible talks about it. And what's been happening for the last, for a long time, Iran's kind of been like the puppet master behind this whole thing for a long time, working through proxies and surrogates. Um, other parties that would sort of represent them in terror and they would fund them and they would support them kind of from behind the scenes there was a small attack in april but really it's been hezbollah and hamas and the houthis and different people that have been carrying out these attacks against israel it's to me it's like reading from the old testament in in second kings or samuel or or Chronicles, I mean, these fights, you know, we've talked about it where the kings and then more kings and then more kings came around the nation of Israel and how Israel had to fight and pray their way out of it. So they've got Hezbollah in the north. They've got Hamas in the west, which is in the Gaza Strip area. Um, they've got the Houthis. I think they're pronounced Houthis, Houthis in the um, south. There's actually seven what they call war fronts that Israel has been fighting all this time. And in recent weeks, Israel has wiped out the leaders of Hezbollah. Wiped them out. And you can clap if you want. Um, they've wiped out Hamas in large part. I mean, there's still some remnants and they have to deal with these things. But beginning last week now, Iran, Iran kind of came out from behind all this and fired hundreds of missiles, thousands of rockets against Israel. They have never made a secret that they want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. Muslim extremists and jihadists have been talking about this for a thousand years. Want to eradicate and obliterate. It's one thing to destroy a people and to destroy their land, but they, saw, they said obliterate, which means they don't even want them to be in anyone's memory, obliterated from consciousness. They want no part of it. And Israel's position is that, hey, if someone attacks us, we're going to attack them in greater measure. Two, th you hit me once, I'm going to hit you two, three, four times, whatever it takes. Israel does not attack others unprovoked. Israel, their military is called the Israeli Defense Forces, right? And so what they do is they defend themselves, understandably. Now, the masks are off. 
And it is good versus evil, and you must choose a side. And as far as Israel is concerned, they're fighting for their very existence. They know if these people have their way, we're gone. And they're fighting for their very survival. Now, we know our Bible, and there's, the Bible says that they're going to be okay, in a sense. And we'll get into that a little bit today. Um, they, they don't know it like we do, but at least not the New Testament. But um, what this could lead to on the world stage is Israel now having an opportunity to retaliate and take out some military installations where nuclear weapons are being developed. Iran has been trying for a long time to develop nuclear weapons. If they can take out those installations, and that is definitely their aim, they want to take them out. They do not want Iran to have military, uh, nuclear capabilities, and neither should you. Because, I mean, that's terrifying, alarming at the very least, the thought. Because here's the thing, a Muslim, a jihadist, extremist they have an eschatology which is a end times uh philosophy a belief system that tells them this is this is what they believe that they're going to dominate the world that they're going to dominate and subjugate the world by the sword and that they're going to wipe out the jewish people and the rest of the world will be um oppressed and they hold the belief that the most noble way to die is as a martyr in service to allah that's the greatest. You get to live with all the virgins, and I probably shouldn't say this, but you know what? Maybe it's just no uh, coincidence that a bunch of them got their privates blown off with, with. Uh, um, sorry, babe. That happened with the pagers and stuff like that. I'm like, <laughs> I mean that, and and okay, move on. Um, but they hold the belief that. That's the best way they can die. That's why suicide vests are a thing. And if it's up to them and they have nuclear capabilities, it's almost like strapping a suicide vest on their whole nation to get at the enemy no matter who dies in the fallout of the nuclear attack. So um, this may be the chance that Israel's been waiting for for a long time to take out those nuclear facilities and then hopefully prepare for an unprecedented time of peace. And that's supposed to precede the war of Gog and Magog. If you know your, your end time stuff, Gog is a, a person and Magog is a nation and thought to be Russia. Um, anyway, I'm not going to get too far into that. But in, in that huge war that's going to take place, the country's names have changed. But if you lay a biblical map over the territory in the Middle East, you're going to see that it does include Lebanon and it does include Syria and it includes um, Iran, and the other nations that are involved right now. It is like reading the pages of Scripture. So fascinating to me this week. So what's been happening is Israel has been effectively cutting off the heads of the snakes that have been attacking them. These are terrorist organizations. And I want to be clear, no one's bloodthirsty. Well, we're not bloodthirsty. Um, it's not the people of Lebanon and the people of Palestine and the people of Gaza or, or any of these other places. It's their leadership. It's the leadership that's after Israel. The people want peace. The people don't want bombs going off all the time, families being raided and, and, and hurt and burned and all that other stuff. But these terrorist organizations, Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. They're so strong, they hijacked the whole country of Lebanon. They took it right over because there was weak leadership in place in Lebanon, and now it's run by a terrorist regime. And... Um, there are brothers and sisters, and we need to pray for brothers and sisters that are coming to the Lord, even in Iran. There is an underground, growing under, underground uh, movement of Christianity that is finding its way into these Muslim countries. They don't want the stuff that they've had. They want the truth. And uh, so, so remember that as we talk about these nations. We're not talking about the people. We're talking about the leadership. And Israel is going to great lengths to pr protect innocent civilians. They, and they have to because these terrorist organizations are so cruel and so ruthless. You know what? They have policies, a rocket in every garage, uh, a missile in every kitchen. That If Israel wants to take out the military installations that these people that are attacking them from all sides have, then they have to go because the rocket launcher is in an apartment complex. And the, the missiles are coming from a preschool or a hospital or places that are 
full of people because they don't care about the people, number one, and they know, number two, that if Israel dares strike back, the whole world is going to see Israel. Oh, they're attacking babies and civilians. They, they bombed a children's hospital and they do all that, but it's because of where they put their installation. So what Israel has been doing on record is they drop leaflets. They tell people, please, they broadcast, get out, get out. We have no quarrel with you, but we've been attacked and we must retaliate. And if we don't retaliate, then uh, we will be you know, we, we won't have a future. So we're going to retaliate. We're going to, you, you got to go. They're telling them with text messages and with um, 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 broadcasts, leaflets that they drop, all kinds of stuff. So, so that's what Israel's been doing. And they, they made millions of phone calls too. I, I read this, but um, they want to get the, the people out of harm's way. And so what happened recently is Bibi Netanyahu went and spoke at the United Nations. And the United Nations has been very, very cruel to Israel, even though Israel's a member. And um, they, he made a speech. And during the speech, uh, Hezbollah, the head of Hezbollah's name is Nasrallah. Nasrallah, I think it's called. And he had 100 generals with him. And during the speech that Netanyahu gave the United Nations about Iran and about the unfair treatment of Israel is when the attack happened. It was kind of a brilliant diversion. And um, it was a huge, huge victory. Huge. Because this guy, Nasrallah, they, they say internationally, it was the biggest, um, biggest military takeout of a, of a terrorist leader, bigger than Soleiman and... Um, al-Baghdadi, even bigger than bin Laden by far, they say, at least on the world scale. So this is a huge, huge victory. So Netanyahu goes into the United Nations, and you can see the other leaders get up and leave. He's coming to the, to the podium, and he has families with him, and the families have hostages, and the hostages are still being held by Hamas as human shields and being held in captivity. And he's got their families with, with him to make a plea to the United States. And they're cheering for him, understandably, but other leaders, I'm talking a lot. You can see it on, online. They're, they're walking out. There's empty chairs everywhere in the General Assembly of the United Nations. And the United Nations is supposed to be a peacekeeping body where we all come together. Can't we all just get along? And they, um, there's very few people that got to hear this speech that he gave. And I just, I'm thinking of Second Chronicles. It says, the armies of Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Munites declared war on Jehoshaphat. I mean, it's just like biblical times. And what you need to know, I believe, is that if King David were alive right now, he would be holding the heads of these terrorist leaders like Nasrallah, holding them up just like he did the head of Goliath, because they are coming against God's people, and um, that Israel just took him out. And it's okay to clap. Now, we're not clapping for bloodshed. Um, we would be cheering if, if that happened, just like Melinda. But I want, I want to be clear about something, because, you know, people start saying, oh, Israel's mean and Israel's going to strike back and they're going to strike back hard. The Lord doesn't like anyone to perish. It says here emphatically in Ezekiel, I take no pleasure even in the death of wicked people. You understand? So God doesn't glory even in the death of wicked people. He says, I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. He says, turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? So I want you to know your God's heart is not to delight in the death of the wicked. Okay? And so we, we don't either, but what we do delight in is that God keeps his word. That God says you're protected, you're protected. If God says something's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. So we're not for war or violence, but we just get excited about God keeping his word. And so, so now Iran has engaged directly. Um, on a much larger scale, because now the puppets are kind of being taken out and beheaded, not beheaded, but, you know, theoretically. Um, and what, the way Israel responds to this attack that just took place is going to determine what happens next on the world stage in these other countries. And that speech that Bibi Netanyahu gave, oh my goodness, it is one of the most incredible speeches, one of the best, bravest, most inspiring, resolute speeches that I have ever heard. If you want to check it out, go to timesofisrael.com. It's him, just like 
I am. He's at a podium in the United Nations General Assembly, and he's, te he's telling an incredible story. And uh, unfortunately, like I said, a lot of people left, but you got to check it out if you're interested. The, in Zechariah 12, it says, all the nations will gather against it to, move, to try to move it. All the nations will gather together against Israel to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. You can see it on the video. All these nations. The premier peacekeeping body of the world, made, made up of other nations, funded in huge part by the United States, who not only has allowed Iran to be a member, but has stood by and watched and watched these terrorist acts and watched as they've tried and tried to try to get nuclear um, weaponry and develop this nuclear arsenal while um, they continue to fund terrorist attacks unprovoked on countries throughout the world, especially on Israel. Are you with me so far? Just trying to lay a foundation here. So, so something that I saw was um, in the United Nations General Assembly, what the UN does if a country is misbehaving, they'll come out and they, they will condemn it. They'll say, that's no good. That's not good for world health. That's cruel to humanity. It's not good. We're going to not, you know, we, we condemn that action. In the last 10 years, if you take all the members apart from Israel, the number of what they call condemnations has been 73. They've condemned, seven, they've issued 73 condemnations against other countries that belong to the United Nations, saying basically we don't like that. 73, everybody combined. Israel, 174 condemnations in the last 10 years, more than double all the other countries combined. I just feel like the Bible says discern the times. It says that we're supposed to know some things, and I just really felt the Lord have me go this direction for today. Do you know where the word Palestine came from? Some of you in first service, that were in first service, you know. Palestine, first of all, when they talk about Palestinians, there was never a Palestinian race or tribe or people or culture or anything like that. There's no, you know, like... Uh, like there are with other nationalities. There was never that. The word Palestine came in the year 135 AD. There was a Roman emperor by the name of Hadrian, or Hadrian, and this emperor was ticked off at the Jewish people because they, they had this, this nagging urge to be self-governed. They wanted freedom. They got on his nerves. He said, like, these people are on my nerves so bad. What can I do? First thing I'm going to do is evict them from Jerusalem. He evicts them from their holy capital city of Jerusalem, kicks them out. Then he says, I'm going to name the whole region Palestina, Palestina. And Palestina is the Italian version of the word Philistine. He said, I'm going to name the whole region after their arch enemy, from all of history, we're going to call it Palestine. So it's named after the Philistines. Remember David and Goliath and the Philistines and the armies of God coming after the armies of God. So this emperor, an Italian emperor, and I love my Italian brothers and my paisans, but this guy decided as a punishment to Israel to call it Palestine, name it after their arch enemy, evict them out of Jerusalem. That's how he got its name. Do you know what Palestine and Philistine means in the original Hebrew? Invader, occupier, that's the original language. Can you imagine the cruelty? So that's what happened, and that's why, um, that's just something I think we ought to know, because uh, that's the truth, and you can check it out. So, are we on the precipice of another world war? Maybe. Is this the beginning of the end? I don't know. Does this war relate to Bible prophecy? Absolutely, 100%. This war is a signpost. It's pointing to biblical times and end times prophecy. I'm not saying the end is here. I'm saying these are signposts that move us forward and closer to what biblical prophecy says is going to happen. Wars, disasters, rumors of war. It says they're going to come like birth pains. And I think, you know, moms in here that have given birth can attest to that. They, they increase in frequency and intensity as the baby gets closer. Wars, disasters, and rumors of war will also increase in number and intensity, just like labor pains, as it gets closer and closer. So it's not the end, but it is the alarm clock sounding off that the end is coming. And your stance on Israel matters. 
how you think about it, how you pray about it, or don't. It matters, guys. If you're a believer, the Bible has commanded you to be an ally of Israel and Jerusalem in your thoughts and in your prayers and in your giving and in your heart of compassion toward God's people. It's impossible, I'll even say, to be a serious student of the Bible and a dedicated believer without understanding your responsibilities to spiritual Israel and to natural Israel. I'll explain the difference pretty soon. <clears throat> In a nutshell, all Bible prophecy revolves around Israel, and all Israel prophecy revolves around Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, is not only the capital of Israel, but after the rapture and the great tribulation, God's going to exalt Israel to such a degree that it will become the capital of the entire world. It will, the world will be ruled from right there. And I want to touch a little bit before I get into the prophetic um, parallels. Is this too much information, you guys? Okay, good, because <laughs> it's more. Um, replacement theology is something that is taking, it's, it's invaded the church, and you have to be very careful. Uh, replacement, re, in, a, in a simple description, replacement theology means that you think that whatever God said to the church, to Israel is the church, the, that the church has now taken place of Israel, that all the promises that God made to Israel now belong to the church, and maybe Israel's no longer even relevant. They don't serve a purpose anymore because, you know, after Jesus came, well, they rejected the Messiah, and now God only works through the church. You know, they are disobedient. Those promises all belong to us right now. They forfeited their position. That's kind of a replacement um, theology. Okay, so hear me good. There are parallels. There are promises that most definitely involve us. We are the church. We are what's known as spiritual Israel, where... The nation of Israel and the Jewish people are natural Israel. So there are promises that definitely apply to us. But every single thing that God promised the nation of Israel, every single thing that God promised the nation of Israel has been fulfilled. Not one promise has ever been broken physically as well. It's not just allegorical. It's not just symbolic. Are you with me? Okay, you got to know that. Those promises to Israel are promises to Israel. Now, again... We're in on that, and I'll, I'll, you have to kind of sort this out as you do your own Bible study and your own discipleship, and you look at the, con the, the context of, of some of the promises, and we don't have time today. But Jeremiah 31, 35 says, here's what the Lord says. The one that appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name, in case you didn't know. And that's how my life is. Every day is when the sun shines and nighttime is when the stars and moon come out. Is it like that with you guys? Okay, good. Um, it says, only if these decrees vanish from my sight, God says, will Israel ever cease being a nation before me? So I just think, well, the enemies of Israel might as well try to find some kind of space jam uh, new weapons that can snuff out the stars and the sun because... That's the only way Israel is going to vanish as a nation. It's not going to happen. You with me? A lot of people feel that a large, prosperous nation like the United States, they might hold the key to Israel's survival, but I'll give you an opposite view. Based on Scripture, I believe that Israel is the key for our survival. I love this country. I am a patriot, but I am a Christian first by a long way. It's not even... They're not even in competition at all. And I believe there are two reasons for America's unprecedented success as a nation. One is the fact that this nation really was founded on biblical principles. And the other is that the U.S. has, generally speaking, throughout time, been a great friend to Israel, probably a best friend to Israel. And I think you can take those two things right there, and by the grace of God, we get to live here in the United States of America. But God has standards. He still has them, and we need to live up to them. And um, I did a message one year ago when the first attack took place, and it's called God, Israel, and Us. And if you want to go to our YouTube channel, you can see it. And it, it, it explains our relationship over time with Israel. It's, it's very enlightening if you want to check it out. But it seems that as it goes with natural Israel, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, so it goes with spiritual Israel, which is the church which is the believer. 
if you believe in Jesus Christ and you follow him, you are the church. Now, this is a gold nugget right here. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. In the New Testament, under the new covenant, the Lord has a people for his temple. And what I believe the Lord wants us to focus on today is the following four prophetic parallels between the nation of Israel and the church that I believe are encouraging facts. I'm going to give them all four to you right now, okay? And then we'll come back and talk about each one. You ready for number one? The first one, the prophetic parallel applies to the nation of Israel and the church is that we are protected. We're protected. The second one, you ready? Prosperous. The nation of Israel has unprecedented prosperity, and I'll explain that, and we are called to that as well, and I'll explain that too. Parallel number three, passionate. Now, this is a potential parallel. You have to be passionate for this to apply, and I'll explain that. And then if you're ready for number four, say I. Prepared. Prepared. Got the notes out of the way. Now we're going to go back and talk to him. Or talk about him, I should say. Um, okay. Protected. The nation of Israel is surrounded by nations and leaders and armies whose primary desire is to snuff them out, destroy them, obliterate them, take them out. And by the way, right after their chant, death to Israel, death to Israel, death to Israel, they have another one. You know what it is? Death to America, death to America, death to America. It's on picket lines. It's, it's all over the place. Um, so anti-Semitism, which is anti-Jew, is at an all-time high worldwide. There's been an exponential increase in threats against Jewish people across the globe. As a nation, Israel is tiny. It's about the size of New Jersey. That's the whole superpower country of Israel. They have the Iron Dome. They have these different defense systems far better than anyone else. They've been so um, protected. But they're only a third the size of San Bernardino County. That's how small they are. One, what is it? One-tenth of one percent of what is called the Middle East. That's one one thousandth in land mass. That's how small Israel is. They're tiny. They're surrounded. Rocket attacks, terror attacks, hatred on all sides, and yet they're protected. Through crisis after crisis, trial after trial, threat after threat, false accusation after false accusation, they are protected. Al-Qaeda can't destroy them. Hamas can't destroy them. Hezbollah cannot destroy them. Iran will not destroy them. The UN cannot minimize Israel's role as a superpower. Why? Because they're protected by the hand of the Lord. That is the good news. No matter what assails them, no matter what comes at them, the God of the Bible protects them supernaturally the same way that he always has. And good to note, every empire that has attacked Israel has faded into nothing. There was something called a Roman Empire at one time, remember? It's in our Bible. Gone. Gone. Babylon, gone. Third Reich, adios. Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, gone, gone, gone. All passed away, but Israel, that little tiny nation, remains. Saddam couldn't flatten Israel with missiles. The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, could not overthrow her. Russia cannot undermine her. China's massive war machine will not be able to do it, but God said he or because God said he will protect Jerusalem and Israel. Okay, you got that, right? As it is with spiritual or natural Israel, so it is with spiritual Israel, so it is with us. I love that. We are protected. We are not to be people of fear. So we're not to fall apart because of all this. Um, psalm 91, it's a great Psalm 91, 9 through 12 says, If you make the Lord your refuge... If you do, say, I do. If you make the most high your shelter, if you do, say, I do. Good, because then no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels. Imagine, God will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. Hey, Michael, protect them. Handle it. 
all the angels, go. Take, take care. Take care. That's my, that's my little guy, Pastor Dave here. He's been studying my word all these hours. I want you to protect him. And, and I got some people over here. They're not studying my word, but they're in church. And, and it's not something we earn. But God says, if you're a believer, I'm going to protect you. I got to be careful because everybody go, oh, you're trying to preach works theology. No, I'm not. Um, but listen to that. No plague will come near your home. He'll order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They'll hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And in Genesis 12, 2, I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you and make you famous, and you'll be a blessing to others. I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and, and treat you with contempt. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. To this day, that scripture proves true. The people who preserve and protect and defend Israel are preserved and protected and defended by God. That should make you happy. That should make you, if you never said amen in your life, that should make you want to say amen. 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 So if you want to receive a supernatural blessing from God, organize your life in such a way that you bless Israel. And just as it is with natural Israel, it is with spiritual Israel. That's us. It doesn't matter what comes against you. It doesn't matter how many enemies surround you or what forces come against you or what kind of trial you have going on in your home or in your family. Scripture says he'll give his angels charge over us and he will keep us in all of our ways that we're protected, much like Israel is protected. Now, there are enemies of both, but they will not prosper against us, thus saith the Lord. 54, 17, Isaiah in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. Man, this is good stuff. I'm glad I got to come to a second service. And the Bible says you can put a hedge or a wall of protection around our children, around our families, and just like Israel... There is no natural explanation of why we're so protected. The size of, man, I was just telling my wife, we watch this TV show. This is totally off subject. Remember? And the person put a gun in the, another person's face. And it was an intense scene. And it was like, it was an intense scene. Where we're like, oh my gosh, she might pull the trigger. She might pull the trigger. And they had this talk. And, and, and I we got done and we're both like sweating because that scene's over. Oh, she made it. And I go, you know what? I had a gun pointed at me one time that far away. A guy tried to steal my truck and I tried to steal it back. And he pulled a sawed off shotgun from out from under the seat at six o'clock in the morning. The guy had been up for days, apparently. And he's got his finger on a sawed off shotgun two feet away from me. And, and I, I, I'm like, I don't know. I said probably dumb things like I do. You're not going to shoot me. I'm taking my truck. And my friend's outside in tears going, come on, come on. It's just a truck. And, and I'm like, man, Lucinda's looking at me like, seriously? <laughs> yeah. God spared me. I don't know why God spared me, but, um, <laughs> uh, huh? I, I mean, because of this word says something that applies, um, I don't know. I just thought I would share that. I forgot all the things God, God's gotten me out of. I forgot. I forgot all the times I should have been dead. I forgot all the near near death experiences and near death experiences. By the way, if you study demonic uh, oppression and things, there are ways and windows and doors that that things get in. And near death experiences, one of those terror experiences. I got a bunch of them, and I have no no explanation but for the grace of God. And so the Bible says that. Um, Israel, ha that we're protected like them. That's basically it. As Israel's protected, so are you. So can I plead the blood of Jesus over you today? I'm going to plead the blood of Jesus over you and your family that you're protected against disease and protected against the attacks of the enemy and protected against uh, financial devastation and, and sickness and strife. I believe in the protective power of God and the angels of God and the walls with which he surrounds us. Those are hedges of protection and they are real. And you know what? Even Satan had to acknowledge that he couldn't get through them. When he tried to get through them, he came to God and talked about Job. He he says in Job 1 9 even the devil or he says Satan replied to the Lord yes but Job has good reason to fear he's like you put a wall of protection you have always do we have it right here yes you have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property you've made him prosper in everything he does 
You get that? The devil even had to acknowledge, I can't get to him because you put a wall of protection around him and you prospered him in everything he does. May there be as much protection over you and your family as there is over the nation of Israel. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, this gets me going. He said you made him prosper in everything he does. That brings us to our third point, prosperous. Nation of Israel prospers like no other. God said, I'm going to take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone. So what happened is that king took it away, called it Palestine, called it Philistia, whatever he called it, and they, they scattered. And no other culture, no other race of people has ever, that I can find, lived without a homeland, without a place, without, to, and, and survived more than a couple hundred years. Without a place. They've, in time, a couple generations go by, pretty soon the language is forgotten, the customs are forgotten, the people are forgotten, the bloodline is intermixed with other bloodlines. They fade off into obscurity and they no longer exist. But not Israel. Israel went 1,900 years. And if you go there, which some of us did last, in 23... Oh, trust me, their, their customs are intact, their bloodline's intact, their prayer, their culture, it's all still there. Because, well, that scripture I just read about God saying, I'll take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they've gone, I'll gather them from every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land. God wrote this way back when. In 1948, May 14th, it actually happened. They were raised from the dead. These dry bones will live. And when that happened, they declared themselves a nation. And you'll see, not only have they maintained their culture and maintained everything that they had as a people, they also made that area which was miserable and barren and desert. And it was, it was dead and dried up. They made it into a, a lush, flourishing country. It was prophesied. Listen to this, Isaiah 35. Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. <laughs> you can see the desert. It's like, yay, we got flowers. <laughs> the wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. That didn't sound very good to me, so I had to look up crocus. I got a picture of it. Look at those crocuses. There's, they're purple and white. The, the wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. And that's exactly what happened. Israel came into this desert land that was withheld from them. They made it flourish. They become experts in farming. They've learned how to recondition water and desalinize ocean water and repurpose it. And they're one of the biggest exporters of flowers of all things, and fruit, and vegetables. It's just amazing. Isn't it? Or is that just me? Okay, let me read you a couple more things about the prosperity of Israel. And don't get caught up in the word prosperity. There's been some damage done because of all prosperity preaching and all that kind of thing. Listen, God wants his people to prosper. And um, research for the, a researcher for the New York, you want me to say that again? God wants his people to prosper. He does. Um, so listen to this. Uh, New York Times, uh, David, somebody wrote this article on the subject. Jews are famously accomplished. They're in a famously accomplished group of people. They only represent about 2% of the world population, but 54% of the world chess champions are from Israel. 27% uh, of Nobel physics laureates. Laureates are like Top, top honorable achievements in an area. 31% of medicine laureates. In the United States, Jews are, represent 2% of the population, but 21% of all the Ivy League student bodies are, are Jewish. 26% uh, of Kennedy Center honorees are Jewish. 37% of Academy Award winning directors are Jewish. 38% Okay, Business Week puts out a list of leading philanthropists, people who give away the most money. And 38% of them are from the 2% of world population that lives in the little tiny country of Israel. It's incredible, you guys. This is miraculous stuff. 51%, um, over half of the Pulitzer Prize winning authors that write nonfiction are from the nation of Israel. And that was only started in 1948. The country's younger than some people in this tent. It's not even 80. It's crazy. 
All right. Get on with it. They're prosperous. Okay? Yes. Uh-oh. I might have lost my notes. You guys would be all happy. Um, passionate. All right. Just give me a second here. Don't want to miss anything. Okay. Passionate. Thank you, Melinda. Um, let me just say one more thing on prosperous. Here's how you get, here's how, here's how you, um, realize that. Joshua 1.8. Study this book of instruction. Hold up your Bible if you got one. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. That is God's word. We are prosperous people. We have good success because we honor his work. And I love the promise of Psalm 115, 14. All you who fear the Lord, trust the Lord. He's your helper and your shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He'll bless the people of Israel and bless the priests, the descendants of Aaron. He will bless those who fear him, both great and lowly. May the Lord richly bless both you and your children. Okay, now passionate. Man, oh man. Okay, 10 more minutes. Can we do 10? Okay, I'll go fast. Passionate. If you go visit a major metropolis with a Jewish population, you're going to see Orthodox Jews in their black hats with their little curly, little curly, those are Orthodox Jews um, coming down the side of their face. They got the hair and they, they look funny. They could not care less what I think or what you think. They wear their yarmulkes, they'll go to a ball game or go, they wear what they wear, they pray the way they pray, they go to the wailing wall and they chant and they, they bring their prayer book and they're serious about it, they're passionate, they know what they believe and they know that they're, well, they're passionate about who they believe in. They believe in God. Now we know, unfortunately, this is mind boggling, only 5% of them have believe in Jesus. 95% of them are not believers in Christ. And that's sad and difficult to understand. But the Bible plainly tells us that God is passionate about them. And they are passionate about him, though misguided they are. God's going to sort it all out. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. My love for Mount Zion is passionate and strong, and I'm consumed with passion for Jerusalem. And this is what the psalmist wrote back about God. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. So our God wants us to be passionate people. He doesn't want us lukewarm. He doesn't want us getting through life, same stuff, different day. He wants us to be passionate about the things he's passionate about. We should be passionate about the presence of God. Wow, that's the greatest thing ever. We should be passionate about uh, the Word of God. We should be passionate about the people of God, the natural people, the nation of Israel, the spiritual people, the church themselves. And we should be passionate about what is right in this world and what is wrong in this world. Do you think Jesus would vote? Oh, yes, yes, yes. How would he vote? Some people, I don't know, oh, I'm going to let God sort it out and not vote. That's not right. That is not right. Um, can you give me that? Thank you, Christy is on it. Your vote counts. This is enough for me. Deuteronomy 113. Choose some well-respected men from each tribe. That's representative government, okay? From each tribe who are known for their wisdom. Get the smart ones and their understanding. Get the smart ones and the wise ones, and I will appoint them as your leaders. That sounds like voting to me. That sounds like voting. And he put that on Moses, the smart leader of millions. Hey, pick some people. So even he had to vote, and we're supposed to vote. How else can you be salt and light? What does salt do? Salt arrests corruption, right? It purifies. It brings flavor. And it, it eradicates bacteria and all kinds of different things. Salt and light. And light drives away darkness. And you can have your ballot counted on earth and your vote counted in heaven and you're supposed to do it. Please, please don't think I'm just going to let God sort it out. You're supposed to represent. We represent God. What does that mean? Represent. I'm going to present him again. I'm going to vote for what he wants. I'm going to go the best I can. There are only human, human candidates in this thing, so they're not perfect. But what's the best I can? And we need to do that. We need to do that. I'm, you know why abortion is the biggest? It's the biggest thing in this election right now. And it should be. You know why? Because God hates 
innocent bloodshed. He hates cruelty. He hates innocent bloodshed. We have got to stop slaughtering babies in the womb. We've got to do it. God's never going to bless it. And he hates it. I got to vote to whatever candidate or candidates are going to bring less of that. I'm voting for that. There's crime. That's more innocent bloodshed. People get stolen from. God doesn't even like dishonest scales. You know, you don't even put your thumb on the scale to act like. He doesn't even like that. He does not want injustice. He does not want people that are defenseless to be abused and tormented. So I'm going to take the candidates that, that are going to line up the best with what God wants, and I'm going to represent him with my vote, and you should do it too. That's why we're a voting place out here. We're political? No, we're not political. We just we love God, and we love what God loves. We got to do it, you guys. Um, don't say there's, there's, some people said there's no verse about it, but I think that qualifies, don't you? Because the first service, I said, well, there's no verse about you owning a house or a car or providing a bed for a young child that's comfortable because that's what responsible people do. Um, okay. God's pro-family. There are candidates that are going to be pro-family, pro-kids, pro-parents, pro-marriage, a certain way that God described it and God created it a certain way. And then there's going to be other candidates that come along where the family continues to be eroded and continues to be destroyed and continues to be uh, disrespected and redefined. And I'm going to find the candidates that align with what my Bible says God loves because I want what he wants. Is anybody else with me? We got to be passionate about what God is passionate about, you guys. He should be passionate about the church. We poured concrete yesterday into all the pillars that are going to, the down in the ground where they're going to hold the upright posts of the church. It was an awesome day. Um, we should be passionate about that. So we haven't started our campaign yet, but there's a plug for it. I hope you'll be involved in that. We got a church to build, and this is serious stuff at a serious time. So please, um, you know. Let your passion be reflected in your giving as well. And now we go to prophetic parallel number four, prepared. Be prepared. Israel's protected, prosperous, passionate, and they're so prepared. And I showed you guys pictures when we went over there. Uh, we had pictures, and one of the first pictures we took a whole bunch of, it was the oddest thing to see these young ladies. Um, let's see. Um, Bella, stand up for just a minute. Just for a minute. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I guess I kind of do. Um, okay. Beautiful young lady. We saw people that looked kind of like her in military gear carrying machine guns in coffee shops all around. And we're like, this is weird. Not just girls, boys too. Thank you. Go ahead and sit down. So, so they do that. They're in a constant state of readiness. When they're 18 years old, it is required in Israel to serve two years if you're a female and three years if you're male. And the service is military. And you not only carry a weapon, you know how to use it. And I was told recently, oh, you got pictures. Yeah, girls. Oh, that's it. You're right. We sent that to you there, huh? Girls getting coffee with guns. Um, so, so, and, and we saw it in action because we went for a stroll the first night there and about six or eight blocks from where we were strolling at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, the news came on later that night and said there was a terrorist attack in Tel Aviv. And we're like, what? Well, we were out there. And they showed us where it was. And they said, uh, a few minutes later, terrorists, uh, um, uh, what did they say? Um, neutralized, too dead, <laughs> or whatever it was. And we're like, what? Response time? Average response time is 38 seconds because these kids are everywhere and they go, look, we're in this together. They would do it even if it wasn't required because they go, we got enemies on all sides of us. And some of them even carry their weapons when they're off duty, walking around. Anthony, you got a picture for me somewhere? Did he give you one, Christy? Look at That's what we saw. And, and again, men too, but it's just shocking. This is out in very happy places. Look. Armed and ready. Average response time, 38 minutes or seconds. And, we, and it happened more than once because they're ready. They're in a state of readiness. And I don't know about you guys, but when the stuff comes, it's going to change my life right now. I don't want to pray then and go, God, help me get ready. Help me get ready. And I'm dodging mortar shells and bombs and missiles. I want to be ready now. And you're supposed to be ready now. We're supposed to be on our knees daily in the word daily, not only carrying weapons, which God says we have, but knowing how to use them. We've got to be prepared. Amen.
Because the enemy wants to destroy you and your nation and your family, absolutely. And the weapons that we have, we don't have to carry the machine guns, but we better know how to pray, and we better know how to worship, and we better know how to fast. That's why we just got done with the 10-week series called Turf Wars. Are you prepared? I'm asking you. Are you playing games? Are you asleep? Are you just eh, dispassionate? I just come to church because it's fun. I like the people. The pastor's kind of funny or not funny, whatever. We have to do more than be passive attendees. We need to put on the whole armor of God, and we need to fight. We need to be ready and when the times come. So God cares about Israel. God cares about the church. And listen, we have God's attention. That's the best news of all. When you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, if you did, he pronounced that you are now entered into the protection of God. Isn't that great, Abby? Isn't that great? You're entered into the protection of God. And um, not only that, you have access to that prosperity. You have access to uh, the riches of heaven and the passion of the Holy Spirit and the fire that comes with it. And everything you need to be prepared has been provided no matter what comes. So pray. Someone say pray. We got to pray, you guys. We got to pray. We need to be a praying people. And the other one I want to talk about is fasting, and then I'm going to close. I'm going to talk about it fast. Um, Watch and pray, the Bible says. You can unburden yourself with prayer. Pray without stopping and believe that you have received it. And I got to just, this other passage in, uh, I'm trying to go fast, but this other passage in Mark, they asked the Lord, that, 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 that demonized sick person, why couldn't we cast out that demon? And he said, well, your unbelief. Oh, and uh, that kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. You've got to know that most of the atrocities happening in our lives are dark, diabolical, despicable, demonic activities. The attacks on Israel, absolutely demonic. Satan's attempt to thwart the plan of God. Because listen, if they can wipe out Israel, then the Bible's not true. Well, if the Bible's not true, no one will believe it, and then everybody can go to hell. They want to thwart the second coming of Christ. There's so much happening. Um, it's demonic, most of it. So fasting, denying the flesh, is in fact a mighty spiritual power. Most of us don't rely on it. Most of us don't understand it because we never do it. Because why would we? Because that ain't fun because I'm hungry. I like my coffee or I like my whatever it is. So we're calling a fast. I'm proclaiming a fast. I hope you'll take part in it. We're going to fast for the nation of Israel. We're going to fast for this country, which is in dire straits. We're going to fast for the church and for our everlasting Father. It's a 30-day fast from now to the election, beginning tomorrow morning. What you do when you fast is you give something up that your flesh likes, and you replace it with prayer. You replace it with some time alone with God, quiet time. You know, some people say, well, everything I would have spent on that, I'm going to give, you know, to the purposes of God. Whatever you do, you take something worldly, and we have messages on that on our YouTube site too. One of them's all, a whole series on fasting. Um, that's what you do. You seek God. You seek God, and you give something up. And I cannot tell you the power in it. Some people in here know you'll get revelation, you'll know things you never knew during and after. You'll get, um, your life will change. It will change. You'll know God better. And uh, so I hope that you'll do that. We're proclaiming the fast tomorrow starting, and we're going to kick it off tonight with a holy fire battle cry worship in the outdoor sanctuary. Don't miss it, you guys. It's going to be beautiful. The lights are all set up. The sound system's all set up. They're practicing in this heat all afternoon. So come and worship. In the meantime, we're living in epic biblical times. And listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I need to close with this. You need to know that one way or another, you're going to die. And when you die, you're going to either heaven or hell. And what you need to do is know that Christ, Jesus Christ said he was God. He lived a sinless life. He died for our sin. He rose to defeat death. And what you should do is prepare for forever by turning from your sin trusting him and living as a Christian with faith in Jesus Christ so that whether you die or he returns, your eternity will be blessed. Please do it now. Can we pray?